Reverence should also go into um, respectful dress when we come to church. That speaks a lot about how we are according to the Eucharist. It can. I happen to, um, I, was waiting, I was waiting for somebody in a reception area and I saw some clips of the U.S. Open. I was amazed in that hot sun how well the golfers are dressed. And yet we have something more profound than golf here, don't we? Okay. I also did some traveling in Africa a number of years ago. I saw people walk, who had walked five miles to get to mass in the morning in a suit and women splendidly dressed to come to church. And by the way, because they walked so long, if Father didn't preach at least an hour that day, they felt cheated. Well, anyways. In a church like St. Marie's, where the tabernacle is centrally placed, it is proper to genuflect when we enter before kneeling in the pew. It is proper to genuflect. Those who are unable can bow, but because of the centrality of the Eucharistic presence here, the tabernacle, it is proper for us to genuflect in this church. Deacon Frank and I have a running joke, however. Um, we say that we genuflect because we still can. And so for those who are able, it is proper to genuflect. Those who have some kind of impediment, uh, physical, may simply bow if that's okay, if that's required. However, genuflecting in the church is the proper thing to do in front of the Eucharistic presence. When people come to communion, there should be a sign of reverence. The most common sign of reverence coming to communion is when the person in front of you is finished receiving, you bow. Some people, however, like to come to the priest and genuflect or kneel. That's also acceptable. These are signs of reverence to the awe of the Eucharist, the Eucharistic presence. Receiving on the tongue or on the hand, these are both acceptable formats. However, there are cautions with both these methods. Please avoid what I call the pincher method. This is the person who comes and tries to grab the host like this out of my hand. Communion is received, not taken. Adam and Eve took the fruit illicitly. We receive the gifts God gives us. And so the hand that's not putting it in your mouth is what you receive it in, and you take it after it's given to you and put it in your mouth. When you're receiving on the tongue, indeed, that's what we do. We receive on the tongue. And so it's, it's proper to stick out your tongue so the priest can put it there. Believe it or not, it's very hard to give communion somebody in the mouth if the tongue's not out. I risk getting my, fingers, my fingernails clipped or um, somebody um, licking my fingers, and that's not good for the next person, okay? And so if, if the tongue is placed out, I'm sorry, this is, but this is what I get, this is what I experience, okay? If the tongue is not put out, it's very hard to place the host properly without violating any kind of sanitation or whatever. And so, however, both the hands and the tongues are proper. We should also receive communion immediately. So when you receive communion, okay, if it's, if it's in the hand, you step to the side and put it in your mouth right away. We don't do what I call dine and dash. Okay? Now, this is important because as Catholics, we're supposed to be trained to do this. Sometimes there are people, believe it or not, who don't know what to do with the host because they've come to Mass and they're not a Catholic, or there are some people in cults who try to steal a host. So when someone walks away with a host, I get nervous. In some churches, they have guards standing at the end of the aisle to observe. I saw this not too long ago at St. Joseph's Oratory, where there's all kinds of people going there who may or may not be Catholic, and there are guards watching to see what people do with the Eucharist. I'm sorry to say that there are times when we find hosts in the pews after Mass. A couple of years ago, somebody came to me 
and gave me a plastic bag and it had a, a browned host in it. And I said, what is this? Is this a host? She said, yes, Father. She said, I found it in a puddle on the street. Okay? Do you understand why I get, might get a little nervous? Okay? Eucharistic ministers are asked if they see somebody doing that, they need to say to them, please place the host in your mouth or give it to me. I would say that anyone in this congregation could be qualified to do that politely as a good Catholic, and I underline the word polite. And then if there's a problem, you might want to talk to me afterwards. But to simply say, please put the host in your mouth, okay, in case they don't know what to do, right? Or please give it to me. When we drink from the cup, which is encouraged, and we do this here regularly, when we drink from the cup, okay, we drink from the cup. We don't dip into the cup. Why? There are some, there are some places you go to in the world that do that, and there are some religions that do that. First of all, the religions, that, the, the, um, the Catholics that do that, for example, in the Eastern Church, the priest dips the host and puts it in your mouth. Okay? That is, pr that is proper, but that's not what we do here. The reason why we don't dip is because we're supposed to, again, receive communion. So we receive the cup, we drink from it. We don't take the communion, we don't take the blood, we receive it. Do you see the difference? Okay? And we drink from the cup because the institution of the Eucharist calls for drinking from the cup, not dipping into the cup. Who can receive communion? Baptized Catholics who are not in mortal sin. And so if there is a mortal sin, you're curable, and we go to confession. There's no trap door to hell in the confessional. Okay? It's the place to experience liberation and healing. And that will properly dispose us to receive communion. Father, what if I have a venial sin? Well, the Catechism teaches that communion actually heals venial sin. That's a sin that's not serious. I told white lies. Well, a lie is a lie, but that may be a venial sin. Okay? Now, personally, however, if venial sins are reoccurring in a pattern, that's something that you should bring to confession because you need healing there, okay? Those who receive Holy Communion should also be in a sacramental marriage. And by the way, I hear this still every once in a while, divorce does not exclude someone from communion, okay? If someone is divorced, they are free to receive the communion. The problem with divorce is if there's another marriage entered into afterwards that's not blessed in the church, that presents a problem for communion, and we can fix that. If there's someone, if there's someone in that kind of place, then let us know. We will see to it that we can help you have your marriage blessed. What about non-Catholics? Members of churches who are not fully united with us are not ordinarily admitted to Holy Communion. There are certain exceptions can, that can be made, but they generally do not qualify for the General Assembly here. I don't want to get into that right now. Most Protestant, why, why are other denominations excluded? Because most of the Protestant denominations do not share our understanding of the Eucharist. It's purely symbolic for them. And also, um, most Protestant denominations differ with us in many theological ways and in many moral teachings. And so in other words, the true unity is not really complete there. And when we receive communion as Catholics, it's a sign Okay, just coming up is a sign that I literally stand in unity with everything that the Roman Catholic Church holds and teaches. I am sending a message. I stand with my church wholeheartedly. I may struggle with certain issues. I may be wrestling with them. I may be seeking some clarification on them, but I'm making a sincere effort to be in union with the teaching of my church. If someone is not Catholic, 
we can't impose our teachings on them, and we have to be respectful. And so to ask somebody to stand for communion who's not really with us, that would be kind of a duplicity, wouldn't it? And it would be an imposition of our, our rules on them, you could say. Generally, what I say at a wedding or a funeral is, in sensitivity to other denominations who are present here, we ask that you remain seated during communion because we do not want to impose our Catholic beliefs on you in having you stand for the Eucharist, which you probably don't believe in. I say something to that effect. Our beliefs cannot be forced on anyone, and we trust that. Members of Orthodox churches like the Assyrians of the East, the Polish National Church, um, they are urged to respect their own church's understanding of Eucharist. However, um, most of the Eastern churches are respected and welcome for communion, but their churches don't want them to receive communion here. Okay, there's, there's something, there's a list of that in the Missal, uh, in the Missalette. I think it's on the back. The respect we demonstrate for the Eucharist is itself a profound testimony of what we believe. And it, now it becomes our, it becomes our task to, to be those witnesses in testimony to the Eucharist. 